Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Designs for Computer Science. In this video, I will continue the discussion about what is science. Uh, there is a lot to talk about, so let's go. So the idea for this video is that I want to focus on our discussion on two historical scientific discoveries. First, the discovery of cosmic background radiation and then the discovery of how to prevent scurvy. After this, I also want to talk about science in a wider context. So let's talk about cosmic background radiation. A lot of researchers in physics are very interested in discovering how the universe works and how it began. Physicists look at the light of galaxies far away, which give us information about the start of the universe. And they use this information to build theories about how the universe began. One of the most well-supported theories is the inflation theory, which says that in the beginning, the universe was composed of very dense, hot matter. Then, in the first instance of the universe, space expanded very quickly, which cooled this matter and led to the current composition of the universe. So, why is this, is this theory well-supported? How do we know that this theory is a good description of the first moments of the universe? Well, it turns out that the data from some very interesting experiments support the predictions made by inflation theory. One of these experiments is the observation of cosmic background radiation, or CBR. So what is CBR? Well, CBR was actually discovered by accident. Initially, they thought that it was noise in astronomy instruments. The astronomers that were trying to clear this noise from the instruments ended up discovering that the noise was everywhere at the same time. They could not find the source of the noise because they pointed the instruments, they pointed the instruments any direction and the noise was still there. In fact, you can still see this noise in very old analog TVs. Anyway, by analyzing this noise, physicists found that the distribution of frequencies in the CBR matches very precisely the predictions made by inflation theory. In other words, we can see that these distributions kind of look like what would have happened if the universe expanded expanded in an uneven manner. So we have a theory that is initially created by the observation of the speed of galaxies moving away from us, that was the initial observation that led to inflation, and this indicated that the universe was expanding and that this expansion was very fast in the beginning. And then after we obtain data and after that we obtain some data that confirms this fast initial expansion because of the distribution of frequencies. So this example shows us how we can use data that we collect from nature today to understand our world a little better, to understand, for example, how the universe works. Now, the other historical research experiment that I want to talk about is very different from the first one. This one is not about finding knowledge uh, about things that happened billions of years in the past, but a much more applied version of science. Let's talk about the British Empire in the 18th century. Ships sailing across an ocean over the entire world, plundering the treasures of many different countries. So the fleet was very important for the British, but on long boat trips, there was this disease that affected many sailors. This disease is called scurvy, also known as the rotting disease. So I want to tell you the story of James Land, a doctor who found out how to prevent scurvy in long sea voyages. So, the question in James Lane's mind was, how could we prevent scurvy from happening in the sailors so that they could work in longer voyages, spend less time sick, etc.? Well, in that time, there were many theories about why scurvy worked and how it could be treated, but no one really knew which ideas worked and which ideas didn't. So, uh, James Lane designed an experiment to try these different ideas. The key idea of the experiment was that scurvy caused the body to rot. And one way to prevent rot is to use acid substances. So in Lin's experiment, he gave different food supplements to groups of sailors affected by the disease. It's interesting to see this and look about what kind of supplements he chose. 
So we have, for example, vinegar orange and lemons, which are acidic, so they follow this idea about how the disease works. Then we have vitriol and seawater, which are kind of neutral. And then we have tea because we're talking about British sailors. Anyway, uh, he observed that the greatest effect happened on the group that had oranges and lemons and a smaller effect on the group that had cider, which is a wine made of fruit. So after this experiment, they did not quite understand why this was this helped with scurvy, but they did understand that if they added these fruits to the food of the British Navy, it helped prevent scurvy from happening. So that's what they did. They started to add limes to the standard rations of the sailors. Today we know that scurvy is caused by vitamin C deficiency. So we can understand the results of this experiment a little bit better. Oranges and lemons, they are rich in vitamin C. Apples, not so much, but they still have some. And these other groups, they don't have any vitamin C. So what, that's why this experiment worked like this. So even in, if the original idea that the scurvy was the body hotting and that acid would be the cure, well, this idea was wrong, but by doing an experiment to test this idea, they found out what was the real way to treat the disease, which was something very useful and very practical. So, when we look at these two experiments, these start to show to us a framework about scientific thought. Although these two experiments were very different, they illustrate a common idea of science. The idea that we obtain information through experiments and that this information help us support or reject hypotheses about how the world works. So this leads to this description of the scientific method that maybe you saw in high school or college. Well, we observe a phenomenon, and then we propose a hypothesis, then we perform an experiment, and then we draw conclusions. Is this a good description of what is science? Well, this description of the scientific method is not exactly wrong, but it's incomplete, okay? It's kind of a straw man of science. So what's the problem with this description? Well, first, it does not explain where the questions and hypotheses and the ideas come from. For example, in the case of scurvy, the acid hypothesis came from the background knowledge and the need of the Navy led to the experiment. So aren't these things also part of science? The same thing with the inflation theory in physics, which came from another anterior research, which leads us to our third point here, that scientific process is not something with a beginning and an end, but something that continues and cycle. One research leads to another research that leads to another research. We can see also some other limitations here, for example, the role of other scientists in the process and the idea that knowledge generated by science changes over time. So let's try to build a better framework to describe sciences in our mind. One better description of science describes the process not as something with a clear beginning of an end, but as a continuous process. A little bit like an infinite state machine with many actors and many possible paths and feedback cycles. Let's take a closer look at this framework. This structure describes science as an interactive process that involves several actors. Each time that we have a scientific discovery, we walk through a different path in this framework and this walk can go back and forth. It can start in one place, end at another, and then start at a different place and end at another. So this describes many different ways to do science. For example, we can begin with an idea that came from the scientific community and end in an industrial application. Or maybe we can begin from a personal curiosity and test the idea again and again many times. Finally, when we find a result, we give this result back to the community. So this framework, with, of course, it's not complete, but it describes science as a living complex organism that I think it's much more useful to think about. 
So let's take a closer look at these different parts of this framework. So we'll begin here at this entry point at the top, which is named exploration and discovery. Here we have many traditional ways where new ideas are created. These new ideas come from curiosities or problems that we want to solve. Uh, sometimes they come from a surprising observation that you found some day that you want to know about. Now, this initial spark is not everything. It can be very, very useful. Uh, but after the spark, there are several things that you can do about it. So sharing the spark with other people to start a conversation or maybe reading it about the idea, the whatever happened, to learn more and see if anyone has an idea of what has happened. And, or maybe just asking more questions and writing down and start to think about what questions this happening brings to you. This leads us to the next step. So after we have an idea and we cook, this idea in our head for a while, we come to the part of the process that most people associate with science, which is testing the idea. And it's interesting to see here that this part of the process is described as divided in two parts, gathering data and interpreting data. This division is actually very important. If we look at the gathering data part, we see that we normally expect from the scientific method, hypothesis, expected result, and actual results. But that is just half the story. The other half is how we react to this data. Maybe the data supports our idea, or maybe it contradicts our idea. This will guide new experiments and new tests. So we go back and forth many times, getting data and interpreting data, and getting more data and interpreting more data. At some point, we leave this circle, and in this framework, a lot of things can happen. For example, you, your test can give you a new idea, so you're back to the top. Or maybe you decide to share your results with the community, and this leads us to the next section of the framework. So community analysis and feedback. This is a very important part of the framework, the scientific community. Here is where you publish your paper. Or, but remember that publishing the paper is just a formal way to share ideas with other people. You can also engage with the scientific community by talking to other scientists person to person or in social networks. You can help them replicate your results or you can replicate the results of other people. Uh, here is also where peer review happens. One important point is the role of interaction with the scientific community. This interaction allows you to view your ideas and data from new points of view. And this can bring you back to the testing idea. Okay, you go back to the top here. The community also help yourself keep, to keep yourself motivated or help you, you get out of certain dead ends. So I think it's very important for you to build your connections with the scientific community as soon as you can. Remember, you are already part of the scientific community, so act like it. Finally, uh, we have the part of the framework when we transform scientific ideas and data into concrete benefits and outcomes. At first, this looks like an endpoint. You can see that we have here new technologies, policies, and even satisfy curiosity. So objective, mission complete, complete, right? But it's good to note that this is not necessarily the end because science is really about how we interact with the world. So let's say a scientific experiment led to a new technology, but this technology can create new situations, good and bad, in society that require further research. For example, we can think of the car that not only changed society, but also generated whole new ideas of fields of research, like public transportation and traffic and new ways of pollution, etc. So there's one technology change society and we want to study this change as well. Okay, so to summarize this video, the key idea is that science is not a limited series of steps. Instead, science is something living, a method, a way of thinking and a community. I highly recommend that you read more about the idea of this framework at this Understanding Science webpage. There's a much more in-depth discussion about this. 
Uh, it's also linked in the related links in Manaba. It's very easy to follow through. The text is very light, very illustrated. So I highly recommend this read. And it has, it has many interesting examples. However, when you look at that page, and when we think about philosophy of science in general, it's interesting to think that the discussion usually assumes fields like chemistry or biology. But how does computer science fit in this conversation about science? Now, this is a question that I want to bring back again and again during this course. Anyway, this is the end of the video. And in the next one, I want to focus on what is, was at the center of that framework, which is experimentation and how it fits with the concept of science that we have discussed so far. See you there.